Having said that, the first uh, Lightning Talk speaker will be uh, Ilya Petrukov, uh, who is going to talk about how to do data, or how to do good with data. When the screen works, you'll have exactly five seconds. Please give a yes, perfect. Does this work better? Yeah, all right, that's much better, sorry. Not used to mics either. So, uh, personal life story, but first a couple of questions. So, uh, please raise your hand if you are working in Western Europe right now. Okay, that's a lot of you. Who of you is on Facebook? Uh, who would like to learn an algorithm that can uh, distinguish you and your personal characteristics better than your friends with only 70 likes? Sounds cool, huh? Okay, so I read a very, uh, very disturbing article uh, the other day, and I wanted to share that with you. And it uh, has to do with this research and uh, with these things happening. So I'm not sure how you feel about this, but I have friends in the UK, I care for the environment, so I was kinda worried what this means. Uh, but I was even more shocked by the fact that it was some of our colleagues, some of people like us who really love data science and do data science, who were behind this, Cambridge Analytica. Maybe you heard of it, maybe not. Otherwise, find it. They did, uh, they used this research where you can actually, from likes, predict what people do and what people like, and they made them really hate Hillary, for example, by just posting the right things on Facebook at the right time to brainwash people. I was kind of appalled by this. Um, but okay, let's see what, um, and they were actually quite proud. So anyway, um, let's see what Facebook knows about me. So apparently I started as a econometric student and uh, I joined this company uh, that's on this um, slide. And uh, yeah, I was struggling with all these life uh, questions like how to not hate my boss, how to find the right partner in life stuff like that, but then, as you can see, I, I got a bit of a vision, I got some friends, apparently, uh, I got a nice hobby, I uh, got married, so my life seems pretty, uh, pretty happy, right? But, uh, so, bad news, um, if you know Maslow's Pyramid, once you got all the, all the basics right, then comes the biggest question, what is my life about? Yeah, what am I going to actually contribute to the world? And um, yeah, you might recognize this. All of you have good jobs. You all work in a stable country. You hopefully have meaningful relationships. And before, between somewhere now and your deathbed, this question will arise. I hope it will be earlier than your deathbed because then you're too late. But um, as Vincent very eloquently put it, how to make sure I don't become corporate landfill. So despite being very happy at my work, I actually started talking to my boss like, okay, how are we going to proceed and am I going to stay in the company or not? And uh, it had to do with this because I really wanted to make a change. But uh, after listening to all the great talks, I think, yeah, I would like to save orangutans as well, but I don't know anything about robotics or drones or mapping, you know, imagery. So how, how do I make a change nonetheless? And what I want to tell you today is that if anybody can make an impact in the world, it's us. It's us here in the room. All of you are very well equipped to do this because all of these problems, they require some more or less complex analysis, machine learning, whatever. And this is just a couple of problems uh, that we are facing in the world today. Uh, second of all, you might think, okay, cool. So I'll solve one of those problems, but I don't have eight or nine months to spare to actually invest in this. And then I don't, and I still run my thing into a tree, you know? So it, it takes quite some time, but there's ways to do that while keeping your normal life. So I had this conversation with my boss and actually doing good with data has become one of my uh, primary things that I'm setting up within my company, which is a company that helps commercial companies. It's a corporate landfill company, if you want to name it that way, but we are trying to do a good thing as well. So that, that could be a thing, uh, same as when you work at Nuon and you try to do something about climate change. You can combine it with work. I know people who work four days a week at Egon and one day a week they're volunteer at um, uh, Red Cross. Uh, you can give short-term support, you can do a project, you can do a hackathon for an NGO, they're waiting for it. 
but basically use all opportunities like talking here and I'm also extremely happy to be and humble to be here as I was when I was at the Women's March and when I donated my money to the World Wildlife Fund because in the end you can buy happiness with money but you can give it away and then you'll be happy but not just money also your brains can really make a change so let's make a change together That was, uh, that was impeccable timing, exactly five minutes. If the next speaker can come up, Thomas Kluiver, please. Because, you know, this, it really goes by fast. You know what they say, time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like banana. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's fantastic. We can, you have set, is it plug in? Because then I can stop this joke. Yes, enough, yes, one, two, three, please give a hand, yes. <laughs> Okay, so not satisfied with the constraints of a lightning talk, I'm going to attempt to pack two lightning talks into the space of one, so watch this go. Um, <laughs> lightning talk number one, python3statement.org. This is the website I have up on screen. Um, so Python 2.7 is coming to the end of its support in 2020, three years from now, and a bunch of, a bunch of uh, scientific Python projects have decided that in 2020, or by 2020, we are also going to be stopping supporting Python 2. So don't panic, but if you are still using Python 2, then start thinking about how to move to Python 3. This is happening. If you want to keep using Python 2 for all time, that's okay, but you will have to keep using old versions of other stuff as well. It was going to happen sooner or later. So. Slam the brakes on that, come to a screeching halt, switch to lightning talk number two, where I'm going to be talking about what I put on the whiteboard, which is NBVAL, a plugin for testing notebooks. So, this project, uh, where's John? Is he still here? Yeah. Shout out to John. Uh, this is a cool project that John demoed in a talk yesterday called Ingle Ish. Um, for generating text that looks like it's from a chosen language. Um, it's, uh, it's a fun little thing. If you, haven't, if you didn't see John's talk yesterday, go and check it out. Um, I just cloned the repository, and this project doesn't have any tests. <laughs> <laughs> but it has some notebooks. Hey! Uh, here's one of the notebooks in, in GitHub's rendering view. And what we can do with mbval, mbval, is we can use the notebook as a kind of very basic form of testing. So here's one I prepared earlier because it takes about 30 seconds to run in this case. Um, this is a plugin for the PyTest testing framework, which a lot of, a lot of Python projects already use. So you do PyTest dash dash nbval lax, come on to why it's lax in a moment, and it will run those notebooks. In this case, it's found two notebooks in this folder and it just checks that those run without errors. Um, so if there, if there was an error running that code, then it would come up as a test failure here. And each of these dots that you see in the test output is one cell in the notebook. If I go back to the browser, I have this, this notebook loaded up. So we can go one step further with this. If I put in here, this by the way is a new feature in notebook version five, which was released a few days ago. So go and upgrade to this. This is cell tags. So I'm going to add a tag to this cell saying nbval check output. Hopefully I've spelled that right. Sorry? Would you increase the font size? Ah, yes. Tricky to do one handed. So I've added a tag saying nbval check output. You may notice I've done this on a cell that has non-deterministic output. That's so that I can demonstrate that this is going to fail in a moment. <laughs> Normally you would do this on cells where you know what the output looks like. So when I run this again, unless it just coincidentally happens to get the exact same output, then it's going to show up as one failure running this test. Come on, come on. <laughs> um, but you get, the, uh, you get the idea. Is it going to dirt? Is it going to dirt? Did I forget to save the notebook? I forgot to save the notebook, didn't I? <laughs> yes, unsaved changes, there we go. Okay, save it. Start it off again, hopefully this time it will work. 
Um, and yeah, the reason that I use the, the lax version of the flag there is that if you just do dash dash nvval, then it will default to checking all of the output in the notebook. And often you have stochastic output, so I like to start with the lax and then tell it which bits to check. You can also start with checking everything and tell it which bits to ignore. And there you are, you can see that there is this time one test failure in this notebook. And when it gets to the end here, it's going to give us a comparison of the output. Here we go. You've got the, the two different forms of the output there. So you can see what's, what's changed. So this is a, a really easy way either for a little side project to do some, some level of basic testing for something that you haven't written proper tests for, or for a, a sort of more polished project, you can it helps you to check that your documentation and your examples still run. And look at that, I finished in four minutes, even though I did two talks. <laughs> Respect. Um, so the next person, is, and, and I'm probably mispronouncing your name, I'm going to apologize beforehand. Bhargav uh, Shinavasa? That's perfect. And he didn't really uh, put up a topic, but it's okay, because he's wearing a Google Summer of Code t-shirt, so he's probably going to talk about... Oh, uh, yeah, use the mic, though. Oh. And, uh, oh, yeah. he, and we need... Uh, ah, you, uh, you have an HDMI cable yeah. over? Yeah. Yes, and you can... And in the meantime, I can tell a joke. Um, ah, how can you improve a song about a taco? <laughs> how can you improve a song about a taco? Screen working yet? By turning it into a rap. <laughs> it's working. Help? Yes. You know. Maybe take it out and put it back in again. Oh wait. Yeah, yes. Yes. Perfect. Five minutes starting from now. Go. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like you guessed, this talks about the Google Summer of Code program, and uh, yeah. So what is it? It's uh, students contribute to open source projects, which and these projects are selected by Google. So these could be individual projects which are you know done by research labs, or it could be like uh, you know things like Scikit-Learn or you know whatever you guys use. They're all they're all counted. And what you do is you code the summer away, students. And uh, why for students? Just to count any students in here, any sort of students. Okay, that's one, <laughs> two, yay. Okay. So uh, why students should do this? Well, you learn a lot. You contribute to open source, which is really awesome. Everyone should. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of data projects, a lot of Python projects, and money. We're poor, so we get money, and it's good for students. And uh, well, if you're not a student, which is most of you guys, if you're a mentor, and if you have an open source project, which I think a couple of you guys might, you know, if it's a small pet project, if you're trying to expand, uh, the Google Summer of Code program is a good way to make more people contribute to your project. It's a, oh, damn. <laughs> Yep. You, yeah. Help is on its way, and I guess this is good enough to do a small pause. Okay. Unfortunately, I'll probably have to do another joke. Um, ah, right, this is a good one. Uh, can a kangaroo jump higher than a house? Can a kangaroo jump higher than a house? Can a kangaroo jump higher than a house? Of course it can, a house doesn't jump. <laughs> and continue. Okay, I hope you're not cutting that for my five minutes. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> kidding. <laughs> okay, so for mentors, why this is important is because you can get people to start with open source, which I get then is really important. Uh, you improve the quality of your package because again, people are gonna contribute, you're gonna have conversations, and students are s sort of smart sometimes. And you're helping a poor student. Uh, okay, so yeah, you're helping a poor student out. I think it's a noble cause, so uh, yeah. And details, well, unfortunately, the deadline for 2017 is over just a couple of weeks ago. But please apply next year if you're still a student or if you're a mentor, uh, you can apply as, you know, you can help. You can, even if you're not part of an organization, if you feel like you know enough about an organization, you can just tell them you're willing to mentor a student. I think you even get paid something for it, but it's mostly the open source and all the love you're sending out. And the really cool part is NumFocus, which is organizing PyData, is also a GSOC organization. They have a lot of really fun projects. I worked with NumFocus last year for my GSOC, and I would totally recommend everyone else to check out the projects which NumFocus are doing with GSOC. And just a glass chap, I'm also doing two mini lightning talks, uh, some selfish plugin. Uh, this is about PyCobra. What is it? Um, it's a Python package for regression analysis. 
you can compare different machines, regression tools, and you can compare different ensembles and aggregates. You can visualize your results like using box plots and QQ plots, a lot of built in things which are not so easy to do with scikit-learn sometimes. Uh, why you should use PyCobra, uh, I wrote it so that would be cool. <laughs> um, it's a good way for beginners to get used to regression, I think. Uh, it sort of teaches you in a very basic manner of how to do it. And it's built on scikit-learn which means if you're used to using scikit-learn you will be used to using this. Uh, it has notebook and tests which is one point over the last guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> I kid. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it has notebook and tests. I'm still working on it. It's a fairly new project. And more details about it, well this is the GitHub link. It would be really awesome if you could check it out, star, raise issues, complain. I like complaints. That's good. And this is the name of the original research paper which sort of, uh, uh, which we are basing our algorithm on. So if you want to Google the research paper and read about the math behind it, you could do that too. Knock yourself out. And that's it. Thank you. Ah. So, um, so you still have like two minutes of, ah, just kidding. <laughs> that's fine. Um, thank you for keeping it short. Uh, the next talk will be by Matthew Wardrop. He hasn't written down what he's going to talk about, but he can set up right now. Yes, and he's coming. It's like a 10 second walk, so then probably, uh, this joke. What's the best part about living in Switzerland? What's the best part about living in Switzerland? No, this is a European joke. What is the best part about living in Switzerland? Actually, I'm not sure, but the flag sure is a big plus. <laughs> oh dear. Still, still where the app? Oh, yes, thank God. Oh, not, no? You sure? Because there is something on the screen. Ah, well, that's inconvenient. Well, uh, well, uh, now? Yes? Almost. Almost done. done. Okay, continue. Thanks. Mike, uh, Mike, use Mike. I mentioned in my earlier talk yeah, this week about in the knowledge repo that we had this internal tool for connecting to data sources. So I wanted to quickly advertise it to you. It has no unit tests, it has no documentation. Uh, it, <laughs> But it's, it, uh, I've released the source code early in the hope that I can get other people to, uh, who are interested in it after this talk to uh, get involved and to help refine that. It's called Omniduct. The idea is that it connects to multiple different data sources and uh, makes them enable, uh, available locally in a Jupyter notebook. Um, so for example, here I just set up a uh, duct registry which connects to multiple different pipes. You can see um, uh, I, I configure a cache, I configure a gateway node, uh, and then via that gateway node I connect to HDFS, Presto, Hive, MySQL, any other data sources that you might be interested in. Uh, and what it enables you to do then is to, instead of connecting to the gateway node and then on the command line running SQL against Presto or Hive, uh, and then downloading the CSV to your computer locally for analysis, uh, you can directly connect to Presto uh, like this. So you can go percent percent Presto, save the output into a data frame locally, and just write your SQL as a cell block in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, if you set up cache, if you rerun the, exactly the same code, you'll notice that it says it's loaded from cache, and it completes in like uh, a hundredth of a second instead of one second for that really basic query. Um, and if you want to uh, rerun the query and not hit the cache, you can run uh, with the option renew equals true. You can also introspect the schemas. So uh, I've written presto.schemas. And if you press tab at this point in Jupyter Notebooks, it will enable you to enumerate over all the tables, uh, the schemas, and then the tables. And this actually returns an SQL alchemy object. So you can generate queries through this and then pass them back into uh, the presto object. So you can do everything in SQL alchemy as well if you're interested. You can also push data locally into Hive. You can read and write from HDFS. Uh, this is useful, for example, if you're running uh, Hive streaming tasks in Hive using Python, uh, manually connecting to the gateway, copying the file, and then checking it works. And then, like, this just uh, helps a lot with the iteration process. And of course, if you don't want to set up a, uh, all of the configuration for like SSH tunneling backwards and forwards between different services, you can also just connect it uh, for a single service and it still registers all the, um, the Jupyter magic functions, like the percent percent presto and stuff. So if you're interested, get in touch with me. Uh, the URL for the repository is github slash 
uh, Airbnb slash Omniduct. Uh, eventually, it will gain documentation and hopefully unit tests. Um, but you guys can help with that. Thank you. Hmm. So release early and release often, but in this case, early. Um, we now have Adam Powell, also no, oh, he's here already. That's great. I might not even be able to squeeze a joke in. Let's see how that goes. Uh, why can't a bike stand on its own? Damn it. <laughs> Uh, okay, because, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm kind of done with all this. Uh, wait, oh, oh, never mind. I have to go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, part, yeah, so the, uh, the bike can't stand on its own because it's too tired. Uh, back to you. Uh, uh, please use the mic. Please use the mic. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Adam, yeah, I work at a company called Katawiki. Uh, uh, what we do is we uh, auction off uh, collectible items, very special items. Uh, and I'm going to share a hackathon project I recently did, um, and with some possibly useful insight at the end. So um, the idea was uh, to uh, make some fake watches. So we sell many Rolexes on the site, and I thought, why not try and make some fake ones? Um, uh, otherwise known as Dali watches, because they ended up looking like this. Um, so what did we do? Um, the idea was to take the, the images we currently, ha currently have for watches and uh, train a generative network to uh, construct fake images of watches. Um, for those that don't know, um, uh, deep convolutional generative adversarial networks, which is quite a mouthful, uh, they're uh, a form of um, uh, model which has a generator and a discriminator. So uh, these are two models that battle against each other um, in order to uh, beat the other. So the generator is, uh, it takes uh, an input of random parameters and it tries to generate uh, uh, an image from the distribution uh, that the discriminator um, uh, feeds it. So the discriminator, um, it learns from the generator and it has access to the real distribution of images. So what this actually looks like is uh, the generator produces a, a fake image. The discriminator looks at this and looks at the, the real images which has a, it has access to and it tries to say if it's a real or fake image. And then this uh, is fed back to the generator and this goes back and forward uh, for a long time. And eventually both the generator and discriminator learn uh, how to uh, discriminate real images from fake ones and generate uh, fake Im images. So uh, our training images uh, look like this. Very low resolution, uh, mostly because the hackathon project was two days and uh, I needed to uh, have enough time to train. Um, uh, round one, this is uh, what it looked like. So you can tell something from this. So as the uh, generative loss uh, from the model creating the fake images, as that gets better, then the discriminator gets worse and then the discriminator gets the upper hand and you get this uh, cyclical effect. Um, but uh, yes, we had lots of failures, so uh, we tried changing hyperparameters, we changed more things, we changed uh, the depth of the network, and then we did more hyperparameter tuning. Um, this is a really, really accurate representation of the, uh, the process. And, and then finally there was some success. So um, let's watch a train and then you can get the, the full experience yourself. So 100 epochs, uh, it's learnt uh, a blob with a dark area in the middle, so it's a good start. Uh, then it learns something closer to the, the right colour spectrum, I suppose. A little bit more structure, a little bit more detail. Uh, now the blobs are conceivably, um, if you squint really hard, they look like watches. Um, now I can definitely see something that might be a watch. Um, <laughs> And this is where I, I finally got excited. So there are some definitely real watches here. Um, there's some uh, more abstract ones. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is where we left it. So we left the training for uh, the weekend. And uh, we finally got this. And you can actually tell the time on some of these watches. It's 10 to 2 on the bottom right there. <laughs> so um, this, is, uh, this is really, really nice as a, as a fun, fun hackathon project, but uh, we find that there was uh, some useful stuff could come out of it. So the representation of the watches that it learned, uh, because the convolutional network we used actually was also uh, an autoencoder. So um, there was a representation in the center of that uh, for each watch. 
um, and we could use that to actually train classifiers for brands and watch colour and straps. Um, and this is really handy because we had uh, a million images of watches with no tags and 10,000 of images with, with tags of um, whoever, the, which brand it was, and uh, the colour of everything and the metal and uh, the detail on the face. Um, and instead of uh, having classifier that was pretty average, uh, when we used the uh, representation we learned from the GAN, it got much, much, much better. Um, so this is a trick that you can learn uh, in quite a few places because I imagine uh, a lot of companies collect data and then at some point they realize they need more uh, more, more uh, tags on them and uh, then they start collecting them but then you, you want to use all the historic data. So that's it for me. Oh, oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep. Well, you, you, you still had a proper 30 seconds, I didn't mean to put pressure on you, but well done. Uh, this was uh, Adam Powell, we now are at number six. Number six, we're going to have a talk about single cell analysis by uh, Sabrina uh, Kirstein, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, perfect. And, as, and I may have found like a nice little short joke for in the middle. How does NASA organize their company par uh, parties? You know NASA, they, they go to the sky now. How does NASA organize their company parties? How does NASA organize their company parties? They plan it. Uh, please give it to a Sabrina. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Sabrina. I'm working for Commasoft. It's a consulting company uh, based in Bonn. Um, so, surprise, we are hiring. So, if anybody of you wants to work in Bonn, come <laughs> by. Um, yeah, I just want to present something that colleagues of me um, did. Um, they have a bioinformatics background and they created a platform to make sing single cell analysis, um, which is not long ago that this is possible, so it's quite cool. Um, it was developed because they found a problem when working in this area um, that if you have a publication of some researcher and you have some data describing the cell that you sequenced, um, you either don't find the data or they do not describe which algorithm they use or which parameters they used, so you cannot reproduce the results. So my colleagues thought it would be great to have a platform to share the data, share the algorithms, or just have something that summarizes all the algorithms that you used, such that you can publish your results better. And this is now the um, platform for this, so you can log in, select some data. This is now um, already given data later on. Uh, in the project you can also update your own data in a private um, room and then publish it if you want to. So what we get here is now an overview over our features. Um, we see that we have some batches of uh, cell sequencing here and we also can filter directly on the batches. Um, here I just go through this very fast. Um, you can, for example, also, or I, I just tell what it is about, right? <laughs> okay, if we have a single cell um, that we can analyze, we want to know which genes are in the cell and what types are there uh, of cells. And what we do often is that we make some clusters of the cells that we found and try to find which genes are similar, uh, used in, in similar cell types and um, what is it for? For example, you have a group with um, people with a disease and you have a control group with healthy people and you check whether the cells are different in which genes and which, uh, which cell types. So what we see here is we had some clustering and we have some cells clustered differently and we see here which function the different genes have in the body and you can see um, which cell types um, correlate in which different functions. And to support the researcher a bit more, we have a summary at the end, so you can just click through it when your analysis is done and you already have an overview over the data, the data quality, um, then you see if there was a batch effect, so if the sequencing was uh, good quality or not. 
um, then you see the details of your algorithm that you used with all parameters. So maybe you could just copy it and make a publication. <laughs> okay. So um, this is what you get there. Um, this is a research project supported by the, the German government. So we are still working on it. Um, the next steps will be that you can upload your data and that you can also upload your algorithms to um, analyze the cells. Yeah, and you can also comment this, what, what somebody does, share what you did with your colleagues. And um, that's it here. Yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, there it is. And maybe just contact me if you have any questions or check the website fastgenomics.org. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Like I really th was thinking that we were going to have to do the clapping a whole lot, but people are on time in this one. That's good. Uh, the next person is, uh, and again, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Chris Schurmeyer, who's going to be talking about how to map dirty data using uh, freeform text. And as he is setting up, I believe I have reached my uh, final short joke, which uh, is making me a bit nervous because there are other speakers sort of coming after this. So how did the Amsterdam hipster burn his tongue? How did the Amsterdam hipster burn his tongue? How did the Amsterdam hipster burn his tongue? He drank his coffee before it was cool. This is not cool when people already know the joke. Um, I, yeah, well, I'll try to keep this up the entire weekend. Um, I only have long jokes now, which uh, actually, <laughs> oh, well, yes. Yep, well, don't need to, yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Please give a warm hand of applause. So I changed the title of my talk a little bit, uh, so it'd be more about application and less about theory of mice. Oh, yeah. I've changed the title of my talk a little bit uh, to do Americans spend too much on underwear, uh, based around the idea of mapping dirty data to freeform text. So I'm Chris, I'm from the west coast of the United States, and so I think I can uh, safely talk about pricing of women's underwear because my background is in computer chip manufacturing. <laughs> So the problem is I have a friend who has dirty data. So basically he has this database of uh, entities, uh, names that look like, the no, pointer doesn't work, names that look like this, uh, like, and uh, APR percentages of debt, uh, how much people pay for their debt, which apparently is not a thing here in Holland. Uh, so this is really an American thing. Um, but you know, it's the, it's the idea of can we go from B of A to this idea of a Bank of America, and then even more importantly, can we connect that to everything else as an entity in the entire world? So the first part's the pi part of the pi data. Uh, so the idea is that you scrape data that has freeform text and some structured text. So uh, in this case, I actually have a database to work off of, but in general, if you have any sort of relationship like that, you can hook it up. Uh, use named entity recognition to learn the aliases, so basically from that dirty name to the corporate name, and then use this idea of a, a knowledge graph to go from the corporate name to basically that entity's existence in the universe, which is a really, really interesting concept. By the way, none of this is deep learning. I, I, I can't keep up. Uh, so, uh, but it could be better done by deep learning. So bear with me. Uh, so retrieve free from text. So in the US we have this thing called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau where they have this database and people say things like, please tell me that sounds stupid. B of A needs suffer for their actions and it's proof with the Attorney General. Makes absolutely no sense and it doesn't mention Bank of America at all. Um, but when they register the complaint they have this weird free from text and they have the company name. So now we can kind of map that B of A to uh, the company name. Now, now, talking about women's underwear, same thing. So Victoria's Secret is a very popular brand for uh, women's lingerie, and they have a store-branded credit card. And so we can also kind of map this. It's actually called Victoria's, Se Victoria's Secret. Uh, this has some other permutations, so Victoria's Secrets. Um, but the idea is that we can build up this whole aliasing map. Uh, there's this 
a thing called the IBM Watson or Bluemix or Alchemy API. When I started the project, it was called Alchemy API. I'm not really sure what it's named at this point, so I put all of them on there. But it's pretty sweet because uh, I don't have to build a gigantic LSTM. I can just send it to the API, which is why it's the Python part, and then have somebody else do all of the smart stuff. And so it's able to say, here's Victoria's Secrets, and then it finds that Victoria's Secrets is an organization. And so now I know that this is the organization that's mapped to, for instance, this company. So then I can take that thing, Victoria's Secrets or the company, and then run it into this Google Knowledge Graph where it actually takes it and connects it to everything else in the entire universe, which is amazing. So basically, this is a, what Victoria's Secret is, is this uh, company that has all of these attributes about it, like who the CEO is, and then that guy will have attributes about him like when he was born, and so at this point, um, we've gone from this dirty data to connected, to, uh, we can connect this weird, dirty string of data to anything in the entire world. So now we get on to the more interesting actual data part of PyData. Uh, doing something boring like looking at Bank of America. If you have a Bank of America credit card, uh, we can send in B of A, and then if we only look at the, um, the data points that are literal B of A, you just get these red ones, so not very much information. If you actually alias it, then you have a lot more data, and you can say, okay, B of A, the APR percentage is something like 12%. And now, the big aha, which is if you do the same thing with Victoria's Secret, the APR is 25%. So it's about double if you go in with these two credit cards, the Victoria's Secret credit card and the B of A credit card, you're going to pay double for your underwear. So the conclusion is uh, named entity recognition on freeform text can be used to go from these dirty names to uh, actual corporate names. Knowledge graphs can connect those corporate name strings to everything else in the entire world, including all of us. And that Americans are going into debt for lingerie is not a financial best practice. Thank you. Uh, next up is Rulof Peters, and he didn't put in the subject, but I imagine it's something with creativity, something with AI, something with creativity, and probably something with AI. Um, <clears throat> so, this is, uh, I, I'm now resorting to the internet. Uh, what does a duck say when he buys lipstick? What does a duck say when he's buying lipstick? Well, then let's assume the duck has a Victoria's Secret credit card. What does the duck say when he's buying lipstick? He says, put it on my bill. <laughs> As I said, I'm resorting to internet. Uh, Rudolf has his thing online now, I think. One, two, three, let's go. Yes. So this is a very improvised talk, so I will just show some uh, some browser tabs. Um, so people after the talk came up like, what was on in the slice? It was so fast. Uh, so the slides are up. Um, but I also really wanted to tell a little bit more about some of the other projects I'm running uh, with, with some friends. Um, so one of them is Gitkive. Gitkive is a kind of a Reddit-style community project, gitkive.com. Um, and we try to make science actually scientific, uh, specifically for computer science, which means uh, real science should be reproducible, meaning in computer science we don't only produce research papers, but we also produce the underlying code, uh, as well as we share the data. So that's what we're trying to do here, or a lot of other people trying to help. It's a Reddit-type style community, so um, it, um, it's still... Uh, paid out of our own pocket, so it means that things are a bit slow. So the website is a bit crappy and we're, we're going to upgrade that. Um, but basically it has all this kind of wonderful research papers going around uh, and all of them also have their implementation. Um, so it means that here is the archive link with a link to the actual research article and then there's the GitHub link. This is a Matlab script that sucks, but hey, um, we have everything. Uh, and then some extra links, and that's about it. And there are some place for comments. So that's one. Check it out, uh, Gitkive. Uh, and whenever you find interesting research, just push it here as well. Uh, or if you find research and you're making an implementation, uh, maybe at booking.com or at GoDataDriven or any other wonderful companies, try to give back to the community uh, and push it out on GitHub. Um, another similar project is uh, creativeai.net. Uh, not to be confused with uh, the recent, uh, maybe badly named startup creative.ai we're running. Uh, but this is another um, community project where we're basically trying to keep track of um, what is going on in this new space of creativity and AI. So it's uh, machine learning people playing around with creativity and it's more creative people than usually machine learning people playing around with machine learning, uh, which is becoming more and more accessible to all of us. Um, so just a big list of wonderful things like uh, before mentioned, like DC Gun, 
using what is called disco gun to kind of generate handbags and being able to transfer those into shoes. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, then there is the third plug is a podcast, Ethical Machines. We'd love to have people doing interesting things to talk to us. Um, so we have people like John Tallinn or venture capitalists or professors of architecture doing kind of weird things with AI. Uh, so this is kind of AI on the fringes, anyone doing something not very much mainstream, uh, especially again around creativity. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, so just send us a link. Um, and then uh, before I go into an interactive demo, well, I go a bit through some of the stuff I showed in the presentation. Um, another plug for people who like to do art with uh, machine learning type things, there's open frameworks, um, which is quite bad since it's C++, but once you get over that, it's kind of amazing. Um, and it has things, let me see if I can find it. It should be. Did I close it or is it still running? Of course I closed it, never mind. Um, so that's that. And then before we go into the presentation, here is another plaque of a, of a friend of mine, uh, Gene Kogan, artists, uh, amazing guy making machine learning for artists. So these are different courses on the neural aesthetics and machine learning for artists, etc. Um, all of the courses are online, all the classes are online, there's videos, there's extra materials on deep learning, Disney stuff, ConfNets, um, there's demos, there's code, there's guides, there's everything, and he's also writing a book on it together with uh, another guy, Francis. Um, so also check out ml4a.github.io if you want to be creative and do some art installations or whatever. Um, and then for the demo part, um, because nobody believed that this was actually code which was running. Um, so here's again where most of this is ripped off. Um, so with, with our company, we have our every Friday hack day. So my hack day, 20% time was um, pushing, putting all of this together, which means I just stole things from people, Ryan Kiris and Gene and other people. Um, so we're loading up some data, um, which is basically a bunch of Flickr images I crawled over the, the night before. Um, because it's done in parts and things crash, it means that I have to load it in three separate parts. Um, then what we're doing here, query image. Um, we're make, taking a, a random image, we're showing it, and I think I'm almost out of time. We're having a, a neighborhood, you can say, okay, that's cool. Show me all the nearest images to that. How much time is it? Are we done? Uh, it's uh, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. So here we have, then it's doing something. Um, I did something terrible. Anyway, the code will be on. Of course, the show did something terrible. I shouldn't have loaded this, it takes very long. But you can see here, this stuff. It will be online anyway. So it's five talks in one. There we go. Thank you, nonetheless, though. Um, I'm happy to know that clapping is actually useful. That, that would have been weird if I explained it to you guys. We'd never really used it. Uh, then I think we are to our last keynote uh, lightning talk speaker, Robin. Uh, sorry? Oh, you're. Okay, so this is. Ah, right, right. This, <laughs> where I'm from, chronology works different. Uh, nine, uh, Mr. James Powell, then, right? Yes, okay. Oh, well, you have to still set up. Um, so there's this uh, funny th moment where um, you have to imagine there's a science fiction setting, there's a spaceship orbiting around Earth with two humans on it, and then Earth explodes. And this is sort of a very bad situation. And the two humans are looking at each other and they go, oh my God, what just happened? And the other guy says, yeah, I, I should have listened to my mother. And the other guy says, why? What did she say? He said, I don't know, I didn't listen. Please tell me you're done. <laughs> okay. I really am running out now, man. <laughs> yeah, what? You're, you're here? Oh, dear. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, take your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah, just, just me trying to keep the crowd interested. Just, you know. Oh, wait. Thank you. Which side of an owl has more feathers? The outside. <laughs> What side of an owl has more feathers? The outside, actually, they do like that one. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, well, <laughs> okay, now James gets to talk, then we'll have a joke from the crowd. So this is a lightning talk for Pi Data Amsterdam. It has a really Mike, 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 Mike. This is a lightning talk for Pi Data Amsterdam 2017. It has a really fancy sounding title, but it is in fact a combination of two really stupid lightning talks. So in the excellent keynote that we had yesterday morning, 
people talked about, or we were talking about human, or models that fit into human comprehension, that for machine learning models, it's important that a human being can look at that model and can comprehend what's going on. And so I started to think about, what about models that can fit into human computation? Models that might not be deployed to a server or even a computer, but that might be deployed to human beings for them to compute as part of some process. And so here's a really stupid example. Savannah from NumFocus, who I hope is here in this room, she's in the back. We should all give her a round of applause for all of her hard work helping put this event together. It turns out she loves Amsterdam. She thinks this is a romantic, fantastic city. And she's lucky because the weather in Amsterdam isn't always as nice as it was, or as nice as it is today. In fact, today the weather is beautiful. What temperature is it outside? What's that in Fahrenheit? <laughs> Exactly. Can anyone actually do this in your head? Can you convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit? It's a very simple model, but none of us can actually convert in our head, even though it's something that would be very useful if one day Savannah happens to move to Amsterdam. She won't know, should I wear shorts? Should I wear a jacket? But if we look at this equation, we can kind of get a, a simple approximation. So if we, you know, 9 fifths is about 2, and 16 is about 15, we can go the other way as well. So 5 ninths is about, if we distribute that, that's about half. And 32 divided by 2 is about 15. So we have two really simple models for computing from Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. I wanted to share this with you, even though Savannah thought the 15 minutes it took for us to come up with this was the nerdiest 15 minutes she spent all weekend. And that's a pretty high bar, by the way. <laughs> but you know, if you take a Fahrenheit value, divide by 2, subtract 15, then you could probably do that in your head, and it's pretty easy. So you know, if we look at the extents, it's a little bit hard. But what's a nice temperature in Celsius? 25. So that's about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd say that's a nice temperature, Savannah. Savannah, what's a nice temperature in Fahrenheit? Uh, 75. 75. So that's about 24 degrees C. So probably all of you would, would like that. And you can see our approximation is pretty close, only 2 degrees off. In fact, since these are linear equations, we should only really see linear error here. And if we graph it over the range of human temperatures from about negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit to about 105 degrees Fahrenheit, we see at maximum about 10, about 5 degrees of a difference, which is good enough for us to determine, should I wear shorts today or not? Now, that leads into lightning talk number two, another stupid lightning talk. The lightning talk number two is about the tool that I'm using to present these slides. It's called Emlyn 2. I do a lot of corporate training, and I give a lot of talks. I give a lot of tutorials, and this is actually the 66th talk or tutorial I've given since 2012. Uh, these days, I never give a talk twice. Every talk is written from scratch, only given once. And writing slides takes a lot of time. So I found a tool online called Scent. It was written by a group called Suckless. It was written in C, and I liked it. It had a really nice aesthetic. I like this big words, you know, monospace font, kind of old school hacker aesthetic. Except I had to recompile the program to change the background color. And I thought that was kind of lame. So I wrote my own version based off of Scent called PySent. Scent was 1,000 lines of C, so I spent 1,000 lines of Python to write my own version where you could change the background color. And the slides look kind of like this. You'd have a file, and each set of uh, consecutive lines would be a slide. So that would be a slide with a title and a subtitle, slide one and slide two. And it supported a lot of custom directives. So if you wanted to change the foreground color, you could put a little caret there, or rather a little angle bracket there. If you wanted to change the background color, you could. If you wanted to add a header to all the slides, you could. And as I started using this to give about two or three presentations, it evolved its own language, which was kind of lame. So I decided to write a new version from scratch. And I did it on the flight over from New York. And I thought to myself when I was writing that, who likes writing code? Everyone. And who likes writing Python? Everyone. And wouldn't it be nice to just write Python scripts all day, even if your work happens to be presenting something to somebody or doing some corporate training? And if we think about Python, isn't it something of a system language? That is, it has a lot of mechanisms, a lot of features, and those features map really nicely to the mechanisms of a system we might create. Therefore, we have Emlyn 2. It's a very simple API. It has only four functions in it. All slides are just lists of lists. There's a function called Emlynify, which takes a list of lists and projects them as slides. You could do something like this, from my set of common slides, import about me, and just extend my slideshow with that. So I can import the common slides that appear everywhere. A slide is just a list of lists, so you have the background, the header, the footer, and the slide. And so if I had a text file, I could just do that. So thank you, James, for bragging about your own library. Um, 
then I think we are now at the final lightning talk, which will be done by Robin Allenson, uh, which is going to talk about how not to do a startup. Startups is a thing I have read about uh, these days. Yeah, it's just this thing, and you can read books on them, how to do entrepreneurship, uh, like how to do be very lean. And you, you know, you're at home, you have like a nice little moment to read a book, and then you're sort of reading your book, and you look at your dog, because your dog's kind of nice, and the dog is sitting right next to your chair. And you really think, you know, outside of a book, a dog really is a man's best friend, but inside of a dog, it's very hard to read. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I was hoping I got my timing right. So, one, two, three, please. Yes, go. Very briefly, uh, this is actually like a four and a half hour uh, uh, presentation. I'm going to do it in five minutes. I, I want you to remember three things. Firstly, I've done a human computation which says I should spend roughly 10 seconds on every slide. So when I do get to 10 seconds, count to 10 in your head. A, you won't fall asleep. And B, you lift up your hand and I'll know it's time to move to the next slide. Remember, the conscious mind is the sphincter of the unconscious. Uh, oh yeah, I interspersed the, uh, the headline, which is the recap you actually need to remember about 37 times through, through the whole deck, so you will actually walk away remembering something useful. Um, so I expect you to memorize this. Uh, I'm a serial startup founder. Uh, a startup is not a small version of a big company. It is a... Whoops. Uh, I feel I should get 10 seconds more for people dying. <laughs> Um, my life is an enormous... <laughs> He's not looking at the screen, but... Uh... You actually get 10 extra seconds just for that. <laughs> my life is an enormous series of failures interspersed by occasional successes, but I lied about the successes. Um, what you're actually told is that uh, you need to uh, uh, focus on success. Actually, what you need to do is focus on failing and learning from failing. So startups are all about learning. Uh, you should do a lot of planning. Engineers love planning. Uh, I recommend that you build a good plan or even a bad plan and then you try it out, find out how bad it is and come up with a different plan. So this is the level of planning that I normally engage in. Uh, so the recap one more time. So uh, don't build uh, your own algorithms. Use open source algorithms. Focus on building an enormous set of data set in a specific domain. Make something original. Uh, original. Make something pleasurable. Um, if you only focus on uh, building product, you'll never get to sell. If you only focus on selling, you'll never get to build product. So you need to talk to customers, get out of the building, talk to your customers and learn, uh, and also build product. Uh, don't copy, be original. If you copy, then my last startup, uh, which uh, was quite a good startup in the end, uh, got bought by a competitor doing exactly the same model, which was actually uh, a clone. Um, we were a clone of them. Um, the idea of a startup is uh, building a monopoly. So you're trying to build something nobody else has done, so you can set pricing yourself in the future and make lots of money. Um, secrets are things that everybody knows not to be true. So it's not that the world is not flat. Uh, there are lots of things that people believe which are not true. Your job is to find those things out and build up insurmountable evidence that they are true. Um, don't do a startup just because you want money. Uh, instead, find a, a problem you're passionate about. Um, don't do a startup if you've already got a corporate job, you already have a mortgage, you're already married, you already have kids. Uh, actually, this is uh, when I started my startup uh, at the age of 37. Um, and I'm not saying that all of you are fat and lazy slobs, but it can help. Um, focus on learning and finding direction. Direction is much more important than speed, right? So don't go chasing your tail. A lot of people think startups are about being aggressive. They're not. They're about finding the right direction before you start going fast. Okay, so deep learning is taking off, as you may have noticed in the last couple of days. Um, but it's not actually who has the right algorithm who wins, it's who has the most data. And right now, all the big companies have the most data, and most startups do not. So you need to think about how you can be um, uh, still engaged in, in uh, this area and do useful things. Uh, the answer is, um, well, I'm going to come to it. So open source models are an enormous... Uh, set of change uh, that's being swept across the landscape um, and Facebook and Baidu and Google and all kinds of other enormous companies are publishing uh, amazing deep learning algorithms for free. Don't try and compete with them. Don't try and come up with your own algorithms for existing problems. Use theirs, but try and come up with your own data set that you can use for these problems. Uh, so what's changed since I studied AI in the 1990s when it was basically philosophy? Um, 
a lot of data, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of learning, and as uh, Rulof pointed out, uh, generative adversarial neural networks, which are GANs. Um, uh, so there are actually, there used to be, when I studied AI, people said, why did you do that? Because it doesn't work. That changed. Uh, Ten years later, it did work, but not as well as software. Ten years later, there were things that it could do uh, slightly better than software. Now, there are problems that software cannot solve, but AI can. It's a completely different universe. Um, so again, this is not the data you're looking for. Uh, this is actually a very deep joke that most of you will frankly not have the intelligence to understand. <laughs> uh, use the web, crawl the web, and uh, we're going to skip over this, and then use com communities of passionate people to enrich the web. Uh, use games to generate data. We built a game. <laughs> Focus on something people really love. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on going. Oh, wait, wait. I have, I have one more thing. I have one more thing just before I go. Um, sorry. Well, focus on things you really love was a good way. Yeah. So there are two, two fish in the tank, and one fifth the other one. So how do you drive this thing? <laughs> Touche. Mm -hmm. uh, You're kind of level, I thought. Right? Yeah, well, well, well touche again, but I like it. Um, so, uh, it's been a ride. Um, so, to, 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 yeah, I have to plug this into somewhere. I have to use the HDMI, right. It's in the thing. It's, <laughs> it's in the thing. Uh, James, could you make a joke in the meantime? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah the thing and the thing in the jiggy. I think I've already made a joke of myself enough today. That's not a joke, James. That's <laughs> How many hipsters does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many hipsters does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> uh, well, the, so the, it depends. Well, no. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing my best, but um, so you guys, it's been a, a bit of a, a wild ride. Uh, so I have been your chair. I hope you enjoyed the conference. No, though I, I have not been alone. There were many people uh, sort of working um, with me on to, like doing all this. I think it was like a good half year, maybe even a year effort for most of us. Um, Having said that, uh, the tradition says that the sort of the, the main lead chair guy or, or girl actually um, needs to present slides that he or she has never seen before. So what I'm about to present to you guys, I don't know. I'm kind of going to have to improvise. Um, so know that. Uh, before I even go into this, there is sort of one thing on top of my mind that I do want to sort of mention at least, because um, there's one person in particular in the committee who, without whom, this event would not have happened. And I don't know if Melanie is in. Melanie. Oh. Ah, great. Everyone just give her like an hour's worth of applause, because <laughs> the... Um, so... Um, so if it, if it weren't for her, like she works for booking, if it weren't for her, we would not have been having this event here. Like in the end, Melanie was the person who really pushed this thing through. Um, and like, just like most people in the committee, she really put as much effort in it. She got so tired at some point, she kind of forgot the time today, and it was sort of a funny moment. Um, so, you know, just saying, if I were booking, I know who I'd be giving a raise this year. Um, <laughs> and we may have that on camera. So. Uh, <laughs> Now we've got that out of the way, uh, let's see what I have to present. So, um, welcome. My name is Vincent. I have not seen these slides before. This is my first time seeing them. I have no idea what the next slide says. Here is my cat. <laughs> I hope that these slides do not make fun of me. The slides will warn me if I spend too much time on them. Ah. This is James bragging about a new feature of... Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, you can clap for this, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, this almost makes me fall off my chair. Anyway, um, this is because I talk so much, uh, so let's keep this snappy. I'm usually a pretty carefree guy. I love telling jokes. How do you know when Vincent is telling a joke? Well, no one's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> this gets applause. Oh, man. Oh, man, 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 man. I'm just hallucinating things. Uh, you may recognize me as the PyData Amsterdam chair. Uh, I am, in fact, Dutch. So if you don't have any plans tonight, uh, you can join me for a smoke and a pancake. <laughs> um, yeah, because that's what we do all day. Uh, this is a picture of me overseeing the committee. 
Uh, so with that in mind, please join me in thanking Bernice, Melanie, Caroline, Tunde, Giovanni, Gabrielle, and Marcel. And, and I guess you can't see it, but on this screen, if you squint real carefully, it also says hashtag give that person a raise. <laughs> just, again, just saying. Um, so also please join me in thanking uh, the Platinum sponsors. Uh, obviously, uh, booking.com. Uh, you know. <laughs> They really did a good job at booking this place. Um, uh, go to the driven. Uh, if you were at the training yesterday, it's the it's the company I work for. But also, we were happy to give you a place for the for the trainings. Uh, KPN, for, thank you for keeping us connected. Uh, thank you to the gold sponsors, Inico and Nuon, for keeping us energized. And, uh, one thing though, like you guys have all these smart sensors and these smart thermostats, you really need to find a way to get the IPython notebook to work on that. Just also just saying. Uh, then the silver sponsors, HCO AI, uh, Text Kernel, uh, Big Data Republic, and Optiver. Uh, yep. Um, again, these, what's also kind of nice about this is not just, uh, we kind of have a lot of sponsors and I believe we have, as this conference, well screw this. Uh, we, um, at this moment, we, the, we've had the most sponsors ever at a Pi Data event in Europe. And why is this cool? Um, it gives me the impression that we're actually getting more community in here. More companies want to show off, more companies want to share. And that's exactly the thing we're trying to do. Um, sort of move away from the uh, corporate landfill, a little bit more towards sort of the joyful landfill of Python and sort of a happy pitch you can just fall into because it's also joyful. Um, I'm, I'm also here to mention that technically, uh, uh, TextKernel was the coffee sponsor. Uh, and please also... <laughs> And please also join me in thanking the fine facilities folks at booking.com. Because, um, uh, uh, and again, I cannot mention this enough, the food was great, but when you guys have eaten your food and you go back here, people have been cleaning, people have been cleaning the toilets, there were security people downstairs, they kept us safe, because, you know, Amsterdam. Um, uh, so, yeah, even though it's blinking, I cannot thank these people enough. When you leave and you see any people still cleaning or maybe cooking, remind them that they've been awesome this year. And give, uh, and there's a bald uh, security guy, uh, give him a high five and tell him Vincent sent you. Um, so th these are a list of people at Booking that, we, uh, that I would like to thank, I already mentioned Melanie like twice or three times and God this is like five times raised this is amazing uh, but one person also we like to especially thank is Aelina because uh, she's been sort of in the lead uh, on behalf of booking and she has also been you know tasked with a bit of stress uh, I would say I think we have a mysterious gift right somewhere so um, the gift is here oh great <laughs> Has anyone seen Alina? Because <laughs> it's, um, we will sh we'll get this sorted out. Uh, the camera's still rolling. So Alina, thank you. This is for you. Uh, you've been great. Uh, please give an another applause. So, um, so that, to the very least, virtually, this will resonate on YouTube quite a bit. Um, and last, uh, thank, uh, join me in thanking the staff at NumFocus. In particular, uh, Leah Silen, Savannah Mercado, and Lynn uh, Brubaker. Savannah is here. Uh, Leah and Lynn, again, sort of digitally aware of us. They're telepathically uh, in with us. But give me another <laughs> warm applause. Um, Um, because you have to imagine, we're planning this, let's say, like four months before this conference starts, every week we kind of have a virtual meeting and people from the US dial in on every single meeting to see if the finances make sense and a lot of back and forth. So it's actually like in the US as an office of uh, people that are seriously spending a lot of time organizing this across the world. I think PyData is at like three continents this year as well, so it's a big undertaking. A bit about NumFocus. Um, NumFocus is a non-profit as opposed to a profit profit. Um, it was formed to support the PyData open source community, even though NumFocus does more than just Python stuff, because uh, it uh, directly supports projects like NumPy, Pandas, Jupyter, Julia, Matplotlib, Scikit-Learn, and others. <laughs> um, also does logistics for conference like PyData Amsterdam today. Oh, there's a big lineup coming, I think. 
Pi Data London, which is uh, the event next month. I also be there if you're interested. But if you're thinking, ah, London might be a bit cold, I want to do something else in May. Barcelona, you can go there. And if you think, well, you know, that's great, but I really feel like more like clubbing, yeah, then you can go to Berlin. <laughs> um, and you know, if you think that's just sort of more the, the countries I've already been, uh, I'm probably just going to go to Poland. I, I'm very curious to see what they're going to do. So Europe-wide, we're already doing quite a lot of stuff. And yeah, as James probably already knew, I will be at many of these. I have nothing better to do with my life. Uh, <laughs> well then, well, I'll see you there then. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, this is our second year doing uh, Pi Data Amsterdam. Um, this number is not accurate, but it's close. Uh, so last year I think we did just under 300, and I think this year we did just a little bit under this. Um, so it seems like we're right now sort of a nice critical mass. This is a returning event with like 300 plus people, uh, which is great because it gives me all sorts of bragging rights when I'm going to uh, Pi Data London, uh, Pi Data Berlin, and Pi Data Warsaw, especially London because those guys have been at it for a while. Uh, but this year it seems like you might have more people than, uh, than Pi Data London, so bragging rights, yay. Um, the nice thing is it's almost 30% bigger than last year. Uh, we've had over 40 speakers and boy have they been great. From orangutans to getting VR to work in like the iPython notebook and... Uh, They literally made me think very deep about what we have here. Um, also, uh, join me in thanking like, the keynotes. Uh, again, I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I have. Catherine Jarmo and Dirk uh, um, with, like Definitely inspirational people. I'm very happy we were able to get them to come here. Uh, but with this inspiration in mind, and you kind of saw this with the lighting talks, remember, you can be a speaker too. Um, we got a lot of people that came from abroad. We have people that flew in from like Silicon Valley, which technically I think is like the other side of the world. Um, we don't mind to say on uh, gas. <laughs> so talk to us. Let's talk to one of the organizers. Um, if not for the conference, maybe a meetup. We also do lightning talks at the meetup. Um, we kind of want more local community representatives to come in. Uh, so if you're a student or if you're like a professor, you got a thesis, whatever. If it's something with Python and something cool, maybe simulating the English language or um, you know, risk analysis for a board game. Uh, come talk to us, we're always interested. Speak at the meetup. And then uh, submit a proposal for next year. Also know that you can be an organizer. You, how do you become an organizer? Well, step one would be to talk to one of the organizers uh, and see what ways you are comfortable to maybe help us out. Uh, we're always looking for companies to host meetups and that sort of thing. Um, so please come and help us with that. Uh, the, the meetup is sort of the nice growing bed for the conference. So if you can help with the meetup, that also helps the conference. And that also help with the conference next year. Because um, I think it's safe to say there will be a conference next year. Uh, at this stage it feels rather inevitable. Uh, yay, right? <laughs> Um, speaking of the conference next year, we promised uh, winners for the scavenger hunt. Uh, so the winners of the scavenger hunt will be announced at the next meetup, which is uh, n which needs to be planned. Uh, but the prize will be a free ticket to the next year's event. I think I've already made the joke that you can buy the early bird or you can get the inception egg. Uh, in this case, the person will win the inception egg ticket um, during Easter. Bye. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 use the toilet. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, obviously, that's fine. Um, so, on your way back, when you've given a high five to security guy, when you've said thank you for the amazing food, and when someone has given this gift to Elena, you may find a nice little flip chart. There should be pens there. Uh, please leave some remarks. We love to get some feedback, but we also love to get some quotes for the website. Quotes for the website convince people that this is indeed an awesome event. Uh, it also helps with the sponsors to get an impression of what we're trying to do here. Um, and, you know, uh, we've been out for a week and we're seriously curious on what you guys think. Um, and before you go, uh, lost and found, I think I know this was a lightning talk speaker, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Awesome. <laughs> um, I don't know what this is, but <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. This may be the last slide. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and uh, as a small personal note, if I, if I can teach you like one last thing before you go, there's two lessons in life. Uh, never let your school get into the way of your education and optimize for joy. Hopefully see you next year.